How about that? There we go. And the bell rang at the same time. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, our class on 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we started on uh, Sunday, and um, <clears throat> we're going to continue tonight. Before we begin, uh, John, would you lead us in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the beautiful weather we've had this week. We thank you for uh, the church family that we have here at West End, that we can gather together and study together. We ask that you be with us throughout this this time of uh, study, that we uh, really dive into First Thessalonians and that we uh, take what was what is discussed here and, and uh, apply it to our lives daily. We thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us each and every day. We thank you so much for good health uh, and your continual watch over us and our families. Be with us the rest of this night and this week and help us always uh, strive to do your will and have a zeal to serve you. Uh, forgive us of all our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're... Uh, is that... Uh, am I missing something? Hit the, uh, how about that, if I point at you? Well, it did it just a moment ago. Well, if it works, just signal me, okay? Um, we, we began on Lord's Day morning talking about uh, an introduction, an introduction involving, uh, just hit the next slide. Um, involving uh, an introduction of this letter and um, <clears throat> talked about um, we talked about the city of Thessalonica um, talked about the length of time that Paul was in the city of uh, Thessalonica uh, when he um, helped to start the, the church there uh, he was there between uh, he was there for three Sabbaths, so he could have been there as short a period as 15 days, could have been there as long as 26 days, but depending on how you count the days. Uh, however, in that short period of time, in that short period of time, he uh, helped to start this congregation, um, and uh, there is the city of Philippi there, number 12, number 13, and 14 are Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia. And then number 15 is the city of uh, Thessalonica, right on a, uh, a bay. And uh, if we look at the next slide, just, just go ahead and manually do it. There we go. You can see where, where uh, the city of Thessalonica is uh, right in there and uh, this is the uh, Aegean Sea down here so uh, that is where the city of Thessalonica is uh, remember that uh, people uh, some some uh, Jews and um, wicked wicked men from marketplace uh, essentially uh, they didn't run Paul out of town but he left, and so he was ejected, if I can say it that way, from the city, and he went to Berea, and um, one other, we'll talk about, mention one other thing about uh, that, uh, but we talked uh, about when the book was written, around 50 to 51 AD, uh, believed by many scholars to be the uh, earliest uh, epistle that exists, written by the Apostle uh, Paul. We talked about some verses of Scripture that uh, <clears throat> indicate to us that Paul wrote other letters. And um, we talked about 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul says in 2 Thessalonians uh, that uh, some people were palming off letters that he'd written or claiming that he had... Um, written things that he denies having written. Uh, we also, this is when we 
uh, ended on Sunday morning. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul explains his personal signature at the end of uh, the letters he writes. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 17 says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Essentially, he is saying, this is my signature, and this is how you can identify the letters that I write to you. Now, of course, when, when um, letters were copied over and over by scribes, uh, it wouldn't have Paul's signature. It may show marks that, that uh, uh, Paul put down on paper, but it wouldn't be his signature. Um, then uh, we, uh, uh, I want to at least talk about, uh, just briefly, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's some good evidence that Paul wrote other letters uh, that uh, we must not have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul says... I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. That's in 1 Corinthians. Apparently, Paul had written them an earlier letter. So if we numbered them, what we read as 1 Corinthians, because we don't have that letter, we just know Paul says, I wrote you, as I wrote you. So um, what we read as 1 Corinthians may really be 2 Corinthians, or it may be a subsequent letter. I don't know how many letters Paul wrote to them. He mentions it again in verse 11, chapter, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Uh, so there's good evidence that Paul wrote other letters. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, and in verse 3, he said, This is the very thing I wrote you so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who sought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. So he's referring to a letter that he wrote earlier, perhaps what we uh, read as 1 Corinthians, uh, perhaps something else. Um, but... Um, Anyway, that's really about all I wanted to say about that. I do want to say this. The purpose of Paul's letter, this is what we're, the overarching purpose of this letter that Paul uh, writes in 1 uh, Thessalonians is to encourage and comfort and give these Christians in Thessalonica hope. Hope about the second coming of Jesus. If you notice, as you read through this, this letter, just five chapters, but every, every chapter ends with something about, where Paul mentions something about the second coming of Jesus. Now remember, the, uh, Paul didn't put those chapter breaks in his letters. He, uh, that somebody later on did that, and broke the chapters down into verses. Um, but each of, the, each of those chapters end mentioning the second coming of Jesus. So that's, that's five times spaced through this book that he continues to talk about uh, Jesus' return. He um, also warns the Thessalonians against uh, unrighteous living. Uh, he writes about that particularly in chapter 4 and in chapter 5. One notable thing about this, I believe, about this letter, is he does not, he does not write to them uh, warning them about false teachers. You know, f false teaching uh, becomes a dominant theme in some of the other epistles. But here, this is a very young church. It's one of the first, if, if it's not the earliest letter, that we have that exists that Paul wrote uh, uh, it, uh, to the churches. Uh, this is one, uh, it's got to be one of the first. And um, uh, that's, 
as of the date that he wrote this letter, that apparently was not a problem. At least he did not uh, really write about it. So with uh, all of that, let's uh, open our Bibles to uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, and that is where, we, uh, is where we're going to begin tonight. We've got 10 verses in this uh, um, chapter, and so I'm going to try to cover at least half of them. Don't know if I will, but that's what, that's what my goal is. And so let's read, uh, let's just read a couple of uh, verses here. I want, there are some things that I want to mention just to highlight uh, for us to talk about. And uh, there's some that we'll focus on uh, more than others. Uh, but, the, but the letter begins, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Let's just stop and talk about that for just a moment. Who is Silvanus? Ever heard of Silvanus? Silas, L.R. says. It's Silas. Uh, Silvanus is his formal name. Um, uh, Silas, uh, shortened, I, we might call it a nickname. I don't know if you can say that. Um, but uh, just a shortened version. And so it is uh, this letter that uh, is attributed to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Those are the three primarily that uh, founded this uh, congregation in Thessalonica. And uh, so they, as is uh, the way these things were done, they start off by saying who it's from and then who it's to. And it is written to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Um, sometimes I like to stop and look at some of the, at phrases that we find in, um, in these letters. And the church is spoken of as being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this English word in is translated... Uh, in, I-N, from a Greek word that's also in, E-N. And it is a word that uh, refers to a fixed position. This is what, how Strong defends it. A fixed position in place, time, or state. So when, they're, when they talk about the church of the Thessalonians being being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're talking about it is in this fixed position of this state of being in um, God and Christ Jesus. Um, certainly in time and place, I guess, but uh, I think more appropriately is this talking about this, the state of the church is in God the Father and in Christ Jesus. And the church is made up of people who are reconciled. Remember, the church is made up of people who are reconciled to God. Through whom? Somebody just yell it out. Anybody? It's through Jesus, thank you. He's the one that was sacrificed. Every spiritual blessing that we have comes through Christ Jesus. God has provided it to us through Christ Jesus. And so um, we are reconciled uh, to God through Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a great passage of scripture that talks about, uh, uh, talks about that. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
um, we just need to pause for a second, think how special it is to be called to, for, to be addressed as being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the state that we should be in. So, um, it's an interesting and interesting uh, phrase. It's the church's privilege to dwell in fellowship with God. And um, so, uh, and that's the only way, that's the only place we're going to find it. It's the only place we're going to find it is uh, in the church. Um, grace and peace. Grace was typically a, a, a Greek a Gentile greeting, a peace, typically a Hebrew uh, greeting. And so Paul uses them uh, both here. Then he says in verse 2, we always give thanks to God for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Um, when, so just, uh, I want to just think in a real practical way what that means for a second. Paul says, we give Thanks to God for all of you making mention of you in our prayers. He's thanking God for them. So where does he, where does he thank God? He goes straight to the throne. Think about that. The fellowship that we are able to have with the Lord. And um, uh, so... He talks about, uh, in the very next verse, the evidence, if I can use that word, of uh, why he's so thankful uh, about uh, the Thessalonians. Verse uh, 3, he says, Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Is, are there any phrases in there that sound familiar? He mentions three things. Where have we heard those before? The three things I'm talking about are faith, love, and hope. Can you think of any place where we've uh, heard about those things? Sometimes called the Christian graces. Somebody was getting ready to say something. Hello. What did you say, Tim? 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Thank you. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, Paul finishes uh, that chapter by writing, but now faith hope and love remain these three but the greatest of these is love um, he also writes about it in first Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 8 there he says but since we are of the day let's be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation faith love and hope he repeats it again in Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Where we hear about those things? In the gospel. The word of truth. Faith, hope, and love. I want us to camp out on those three things for just a few minutes. Uh, Paul says, uh, he identifies, uh, he says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. Your work of faith. Just think about that for a moment. Let that roll around in your mind. What's that really mean? Your work of faith. Um, In John chapter 6 and verse 29, I'm going to mention several passages through here about this. Let's just think 
what that means, your work of faith. In John chapter 6 and verse 29, uh, John, the apostle, records this. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God. You believe in him who he has sent. Who is he talking about? Christ Jesus. And what does that mean? To believe in him who was sent. What does that really mean? If you believe in him, then you what? Substitute a word for it. You follow him, you obey him, you trust him. Um, sometime, many times when we see the word faith, not every, not every single time, but many times when we see the word faith in the New Testament, substitute the word trust. Trust. Pardon? Love. Well, here I'm specifically talking about uh, faith in Jesus. And what does that mean? That means I trust him. I trust him completely. I believe he is who he says he is. That changes the way I live. I'm going to trust him completely. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm his disciple. What he teaches me to do, I'm going to do. That's, the, that's how I'm going to live. Um, and so I want to do everything he instructs me to do. Everything, no matter what it is. I want to do everything. I believe he is who he says he is. I trust him. There's a story, many of you all may have heard me tell this before, maybe if you haven't, but there's a story about uh, a guy uh, at the turn of the century, the end of the 20th century, not the 21st. Uh, so early 1900s. And he made his living by going around from town to town and walking on a tightrope. And uh, his gimmick, if I can say it that way, his gimmick was that he would walk on that tightrope with a wheelbarrow. And so the story goes that he went to uh, Niagara and uh, on a certain day and time, he was going to walk that tightrope across Niagara, right where the falls are. And so the day and time came, and he's there, and there's this huge crowd, this huge crowd. And so um, he's up there on a stand, looks across that rope, had to look a long way, uh, looks across that rope, and he's got his wheelbarrow there. And so he says to the crowd, do you think I can do it? And they just roar, yes. And he says, do you think I can do it? And they say, yes. And so he points to a little 10-year-old boy and he says, son, do you think I can do it? And he says, yes. And he said, come and get in my wheel, Mara. Trust means we get in the Lord's wheelbarrow. Whatever he wants us to do, that's what we're committed to. However he wants us to live, that's what we commit ourselves to. That's what faith in Jesus looks like. That's what trust in Jesus looks like. Why would we do all those things? Because we believe he is who he says he is, and he's going to reward us. At the end of time, we'll be raised to life again and live with him for eternity. That's what prompts faith in Jesus. And it's what motivated these, uh, the apostles. That's what motivated these Thessalonians. And so uh, he here talks about their work of faith. Their faith was not uh, just a formal, barren, dead faith. It couldn't be for God. For Paul to have uh, commended them like he did. Couldn't be. Uh, but we learn what faith is supposed to look like in James chapter 2. We're going to read a couple of uh, verses from there. James chapter 2, verse 20. There's this passage in the last portion of 
of James chapter 2 that talks about faith and what that really means. James 2 verse 20, but are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? That's the question he asked for this argument that he's making. In verse 26, he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. How can you show that you've got faith if you don't demonstrate it in the way you live? How, how could you prove to the tightrope walker that you believed he could do it without getting in his wheelbarrow? I, we might stand and say, oh, we'll, watch you. we'll watch you from here. But that's not trust. That's not trust. The Thessalonians' obedience to God, the Thessalonians' obedience to God brought their will into line with God's will. They didn't expect God to change his will to match theirs. They knew they had to change their will to match his. And that's what working faith does. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, the first four verses that introduce the book of Romans are powerful. They're powerful. But I want to look at verse 5. There Paul writes, through whom, and he's speaking of the resurrected Jesus, he says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. That's a phrase that we find in the book of Romans, the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of his name. In Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, Paul is concluding his letter, and he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now has been disclosed and through the scriptures of the prophets in accordance with the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations, leading them to obedience of faith. Obedience of faith. This obedience of faith brings man's will into congruence with God's will. That's what obedience requires. And this obedience of faith is not faith itself. It's the obedience that faith produces. It's not faith itself. It's obedience motivated by or prompted by faith. It's faith that motivates and prompts one to obedience. So, here when we apply those thoughts to the Thessalonians, their obedience, their work of faith, let me say it that way, their work of faith was not faith without work. It was faith demonstrated by work. Uh, so now I should have said keep your finger on James chapter 2. I'm going to go back and read uh, the verses that are sandwiched between ver verse 20 and verse 26. Uh, James 2, 21. Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was Rahab, the prostitute, not justified by works also, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Would it, would it have done Abraham any good when he had Isaac up on the mountain? And he said, well, Lord, I, I, believe, uh, I believe you okay. I just don't want to do this. This is my heir right here. Well, that would have been no faith at all. That's what James is trying to persuade us of. We demonstrate our faith 
by the way we live. We demonstrate our trust by the way we live, by the things we do, by, the beha- by our behavior toward others, and, um, and all, all sorts of uh, things that you could fill in the blank with. So there, he's talking about their work of faith. Next, he says their labor of love. Their labor, he's uh, mindful of their labor of uh, love. And he, um, this love that is described here is the word agape, and most everybody here, I'm sure, understands the, what, what that is talking about. It's Strong's uh, Greek word number 26. And uh, this is a special kind of love. It's a special kind of love. It is, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, love. It's that kind of love. It is, love your enemies, love. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. It is, husbands, love your wives, love. As we read in Ephesians chapter 5. It is, love is patient, love is kind, love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. It is God is love, love. And that defines the essential nature of God. When John says that in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. This love may involve some degree of affection, but it's not measured It's not defined, uh, for the most part, by the way we feel. Not that at all. But by the way we behave, by the things we do. And it is is, uh, not demonstrated by how it feels, but how it behaves. Not so much from desire as it is decision. Not so much from the heart and it is from the head, thinking. Not so much from feeling as it is from judgment. Uh, it's that kind of love. And Paul is saying that the Thessalonians' love was not idle. In other words, it wasn't some, something they just talked about. It was something they were living. They demonstrated it. When we, when we apply the thoughts from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it means... They were actually patient with each other. They had to be in order to be loving. They were kind to one another. They had to be in order to be loving. And you can go down that whole list in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. And that is an important, important trait. Because when you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul begins that chapter, chapter 13, by talking about um, well, I, and I won't remember everything he describes there, but by talking about if I speak with tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Let's just think about what that really means. From what Paul says here, if he gave all his possessions to the poor, if he is burned at the stake, but he is still unkind, impatient, rude and the other things that 1 Corinthians 13 tell us cannot be the way we live it profits nothing I could sacrifice everything I have I can give it away to the poor but if I'm a if I'm a rude obnoxious jerk I don't demonstrate love toward others it does no good that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is trying to teach us all the sacrifice in the world that you think you're giving to to God, if we don't love others, it profits us none. 
So when Paul talks about their labor of love, he's mindful of it. It means they weren't idle because he commends them for the way that they loved others. Um, one, other, one other thing that he mentions, he says um, uh, that he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, Paul mentions that the Macedonians had uh, supplied his need, uh, said, had supplied his needs. Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, verse 9. And when I was present with you, here he's, remember he's talking to the church at Corinth. It's not up on the map, but he's talking to the church at, at Corinth. And um, he says, when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. There were three churches in Macedonia. Um, three churches up there. Well, let's see if I can get it. Can I get it to go back there? Philippi, that's in Macedonia. Uh, 15 is Thessalonica, and 16 is Berea. They're the ones that supplied his needs. And so Paul can say to the church at Corinth, they love me because they took care of me. The Thessalonians' love was not idle. Um, in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse uh, 16, uh, there's some other comments about love. We love because, well, this is in verse 19. We love because he loved, first loved us. That's, that's really important. Um, God, God loved us while we rejected him. He didn't wait for us. He didn't love us back. He loved us first. So that means that's how we have to do it. We can't love others because they love us, but we have to love them in spite of how they treat us. That's what, um, that's the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have as his disciples. He also says here, Paul also says, their steadfastness of hope. Their steadfastness of hope. What do you think he's talking about there? Their steadfastness, their perseverance, they're holding on to it. What are they hopeful about? There's something that, this is where we can see this theme. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Ah, he's coming back. You do, what me, you do with me as you will but he's coming back for me. That's why the apostles were so bold in the face of persecution. When we read the, uh, start reading through the first several books, pardon me, first several chapters of Acts, in spite of, of the persecution that they received, the apostles in the face, in the face of threats of danger say, all you can do is kill me, but Jesus will resurrect me. That's, and that's the kind of hope that uh, uh, Paul is writing about here. The Thessalonians' hope in Christ sustained their souls. They endured trials and persecutions. They withstood temptation and doubt. And um, um, an interesting thought, I, I read this, uh, this. The Greek word that is translated here for steadfastness, it means cheerful endurance cheerful endurance so Paul here talks about these three cardinal Christian graces uh, that's those are that's a label that men have put on that faith hope and love or faith love and hope and they were inspired by and centered in Christ and approved by God okay let's look at verse uh, at verse 4 
Um, he writes, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a phrase that uh, we read, if you, if you think about it, you remember the phrase, uh, make your calling and election sure? That's from 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, and I want to say it's verse 10. It is verse 10, uh, where Peter says, and be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choice of you. That's the way that it's translated in the uh, NASB. Um, so, how are we called? You got something you want to? Okay, go ahead. Before we, before we leave the other point you were making, very good observations about faith, hope, and love. Can you pull your... Oh, I'll, okay. They, oh, I'll be able you, to understand you. You want better. me to take off a mask? Is that well, what you're saying? Well, <laughs> you could pull it down. That's what people do on witness stand in my courtroom. But. Okay. All right. All right. Well, um... Again, we're looking at people who are in the faith for how long? Six weeks, maybe? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know at the time that this letter it's is written. written. Right. But the word that he, I mean, it's got to be dated based on when right. um, Timothy would have received word from yes. them. Because he brought it, okay. then he brings it back. So to uh, it's still I mean, two, three months, maybe? Yeah. At, so at two most. things. I mean, one, look what, look what level of commitment Paul was teaching them for them to already apply that that's a great thought and then consider the fact that they had grown that quickly you know we, we hear these profound thoughts we think well it's going to take me years to be that kind of person mm -hmm. where we, we see right there that it it's you can grow immediately yes in these things that's a that's a great yeah. thought when you think about uh, uh in acts chapter two people immediately they saw that they saw the need all these all these new Christians and people immediately saw a need and so they went and sold their property, brought the proceeds and laid it at the feet of the, the apostles. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That's a great, that's a great point, uh, Mike. Uh, particularly when we think about applying that to ourselves. What kind of commitment do I have? Do I really trust him? Is he going to take care of me? Is he going to take care of me? Um, which reminds me of a saying that some of you have heard me say it before, but this is a really important thought. Um, if Jesus, if I trust Jesus for something as fantastic as resurrection, can't I trust him for something as small as a meal? When we think in relative terms, what we, we compare our doubts about, is the Lord going to provide this for me? And what are we trusting him for? We're trusting him to resurrect our bodies from, or to resurrect us from death. Resurrect us from death. So, um, anyway, that's, that, that is a, it's a great thought. I wanted to pause for just a moment here on uh, uh, this thought about being called and when he says his choice of you. Uh, does God call us? Absolutely. How does he call us? That's the question. How does he call us? Is it something that's floating through the air and then I can't, I just can't resist it? That's not what the Bible teaches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, you can underline them, especially verse 14. <clears throat> the scripture says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we called? We're called through the gospel. And then who does God choose? He chooses those who obey him, who are, who are living it. When we accept his invitation, that's what his call is, it's an invitation. And when we accept that invitation by committing to live as he wants us to, I sometimes use this example. <clears throat> 
It's like saying, if that's what you want, then you must get on, to get to Nashville, you must get on I-65. If, if I get on I-65, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land in Nashville because that's where I-65 goes. And the same thought, I think, applies here. If I accept, if I uh, answer this call, I accept this invitation and um, set out on the path that God wants me to live, the destination is heaven. The destination is heaven. Okay, we will... Uh, uh, we'll move on from that. We'll start with verse 5. There's more I could say about it, but we'll start at verse 5 uh, on uh, Sunday morning, and we're going to finish chapter 1 Sunday morning. Thank you all so much. <laughs>